freedom. Hard work. Rewards equal to your hard work. A path you carve for yourself. Golden streets. A safe haven for all cultures. Democracy. Rock and roll. Traffic. Loud fights. Hollywood lifestyle. Angry youth. Millionaires, Levi Jeans, Pizza Hut, Watergate, the California Gold Rush, war, and capitalism. These are ideas commonly associated with the American dream. America is the most powerful country on Earth by sheer military force. But throw in the soft power and you have an empire that's equal parts hated and beloved globally since the world wars. Now I get a kick out of the America has no culture memes as much as the next guy, but let's be honest, the reason it doesn't have culture is because we force the fabricated American culture onto the American sphere of influence, a sphere that just so happens to look kinda like this. America has made it its job to modernize the world. However, it's through an idea of modern locked into the start of the Cold War. America's belief of a modern world is that of 1950s America. Or, to make it as simple as possible, American paternalism is spreading unchecked neoliberal capitalism to the rest of the world, an idea exemplified by that of Sega's Crazy Taxi, the quintessential representation of the American dream. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now before we get started, I want to flex my credentials for the subject. Not to make myself look conceited, but so you realize what I'm saying isn't pure conjecture or last minute study. After two years of work, I recently received a master's degree in mass communications with a focus on global issues. A study focusing on exactly what it sounds like. Newspaper, radio, film, internet, and any form that we can classify as means to get a message from one to many or many to many. And one of my favorite ideas is one I will in the short form call globalization. On its own, globalization is a vague term. Like any word ending in Xi'an, globalization is an action, which, like most actions, should have an endpoint. But what would be the endpoint of a globalized society? Every country is capable of interacting with each other? Well, I'm in Houston and can interact with a friend in Sumatra pretty easily. Is that globalization? How about the ability to travel around the world at a commercial price? Well, that's something we've had for decades, but it wouldn't quite fit with the theory of globalization, which was only called as such commonly since the 90s. Could globalization be when the entire world has become one mega country in pure harmony? If we want to say that, then man has been, and always will be, in a state of globalization. I'm saying these wild ideas not to sound insane, but to place emphasis on the nothing that this term represents by itself. As globalization is a somewhat loose verb, I'm gonna go ahead and pick a definition. Specifically, Martin Albro's definition as an umbrella term to refer to all those processes by which the people of the world are incorporated into a single world society, global society. This definition allows more leeway with juxtaposing globalization towards other theories in any discipline. Which, for the purpose of proving Crazy Taxi's representation of the American dream, I'll link it to the ideas of modernity and media flows. So let's get into modernization. First of all, as a significant portion of globalization and modernization theories have come from the Western world, more specifically Anglo-Americans, both theories are somewhat interchangeable with Americanization. However, that's not to say it's impossible to reach modernity in ways other than the American way. Today we can see China attempt to bring its own form of modernity to East Africa, Northwest Asia, and really just anything planned for the Belt and Road Initiative. It's just that deciding when a country is modern is completely up for debate. I mean, back to China, it's pretty debatable if that's a modern country. It wasn't quite always this way. Before the fall of the Soviet Union, the USSR also had its own modernization efforts. And oh whoops, now we're at the entirety of the Cold War. America thought that they could use the implantation of their own media into other countries to sway the globe into growing anti-communist, pro-capitalist beliefs. But it turns out that the media isn't all that good at changing someone's thoughts, instead it just augments their current ideas. Lucky for us, the Soviet Union fell and capitalism you won. Haven't seen a Mormon before. George. George. Down on the floor. I'm not concerned about the very poor. Got it wrong. Sorry, that's not what I meant. Like meaning all of these corporations could start flowing their products anywhere they wanted at any point. So now I'm gonna say something obvious. American corporations have an extreme stranglehold over the export of media such as films, music, literature, news, and television. I know that everyone inside and outside the US is shaking their head at the no fucking shitness of that statement, but I gotta set my point. Professor De Athusu recognized three types of media flows. First is the dominant flows, aka global flows, which I think speaks for themselves. And then the two contra flows, transnational, which relates to a given area, and geocultural flows that relate to a specific cultural linguistic audience. For transnational, think about how telenovelas are popular in the Latin ecosystem and Bollywood is popular around the Indian subcontinent, but neither have a large impact outside their audiences. Examples of geocultural flows would be culture-specific services aimed at a 
particular cultural diaspora such as India's ZTV that allows emigrants from India or second generation descendants to receive Indian media. While I'm not focusing on these today, they're important to understand for reference. With every new piece of technology such as satellite, cable TV, and online connectivity, the media ecosystem has become more multivocal. Unsurprisingly, a majority of what Thusu deemed dominant flows comes from the US, such as MTV, Hollywood, Google, and ESPN. On top of that, US media is almost consistently the second most popular import in countries with their own media ecosystem, and the most popular in ones that lack such an output, making the American dream, American culture, and American media the global one. So what the fuck does that have to do with Crazy Taxi? Crazy Taxi is a fast-paced arcade racing game that flies against the norms of other arcade racers. There's no set track to race down, there's no set end time for when the game stops, and your cab control's freer than the blowy you can get behind Wendy's by the crack, crack addict. You have ultimate freedom as long as you can do one thing. Make money by driving passengers to their destination around a nondescript Californian city. Similar to much of the modernized world, freedom is chained to one thing, your monetary worth. With the cabbies of CT existing on a scale of how much their self-worth is tied to their gains. First we got BD Joe, who's become the main representative of the game in Sega crossovers. His reason for cabbing isn't tied to any selfish desires, but the urge to put a smile on other people's faces. Even outside of cabbing, Joe is a performance artist that makes high quality music with trashy finds as drums, and he's also started to learn some magic tricks. BD Joe is untainted by the sins of capitalism. Then we have Axel, who's tainted by a different greed, the greed of fame. Axel's motivation to become a cabbie is because it's the coolest profession. He shows his customers a good time to raise his own social clout and get sick tips. While outside of cabbing, he tries to pick up chicks, play with his punk rock band, and participate in snowboarding and surfing. All while living in California, the American lifestyle that everyone one dreams about. The dream of freedom and no consequences told to us by American global hegemony. And then our third cabbie, Gina, lives similarly. She loves the thrill of cabbing, but unlike Axel, whose life is based on any thrill, hers is only related to her car. Almost all of the money she makes goes into maintaining her cab, a cycle where she works through her cab to work on her cab. Then we got our fourth guy, Gus. Gus is a drifter that created the crazy style of cabbing. Gus finds himself drawn to new and wild things. And as he got older, he got hooked on gambling with games like Baccarat, Blackjack, and Poker. He's always aiming for the big bucks. His license plate even reads, only triple seven on it. Gus is a trendsetter aiming for the top. What I want to get through about the four cabbies is that they represent a scale of the US's two defining characteristics, freedom and capitalism. BD Joe cherishing his freedom the most, while Gus cares most about his pay. As well, Gus, Axel, and Gina all live a typical California lifestyle portrayed by the media. These four are trying their best to achieve upward mobility in society through only the means they want to, something many Americans fall out of due to societal pressures. So let's get to the content of the game itself. Crazy Taxi originally released in arcades in early 1999 as a standard racing arcade cabinet. Seat, brakes, gas, monitor, wheel, and a shift, but it only has forward and reverse. It was one of the earlier games on Sega's Naomi hardware, which, for reference, means it's close in power to a Dreamcast. There's also this stand-up version that I've only seen in person once. I hate these. Don't design your racing games like this. So most racing games at the time followed the formula of 100 yen equals 3 minutes of fun, the most basic monetary transaction you can think of. However, Crazy Taxi shakes it up. Your playtime is based entirely on your skills for driving passengers around town. Game starts and you have 60 seconds on the clock on the default setting. Whenever you pick up a passenger, you gain more time to your clock, variable by the distance the passenger wants to go. So if someone wants to go far, you'd get 60 seconds added to the clock. If they want to go down two blocks, you'd get maybe 15 extra seconds. And those seconds stay with you no matter how long it takes. So if you do a 60 second trip in 20 seconds, you've got 40 extra left over, as well as bonus seconds earned if you were fast enough. Introducing the big decision you as a player and business owner have to make. Do you pick up the pedestrians that need a short ride to earn fast cash, or the pedestrians that require a further ride that pay better and give more time? You might think you should just always go for the latter, but that comes with risks as well. Further distance to go means more chances to fuck up, but also more chances to do tricks. You've got to wage your own skills against the risks. As well, the pedestrians desiring longer trips don't show up as often. So if the 
clock's at 10 seconds left, you need to pick up who you can as fast as possible, which in the arcade carries over to the player's own experience. You're not just losing a chance to deliver a passenger when you mess up, you're losing the worth of your own payment. So if you have less money on you, you have to work harder to maintain your business and playtime. The point is that this portrayal of cabbing in both the game and onto the player is something only possible through the quarter-munching structure of arcades, giving you the feeling of the positive part of the American dream. Let's get to the ugly part. If you're American or watched any American media ever, so I imagine next to all of you, you'd know that America isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Advertising everywhere, racial inequality that's controversial to state if it exists, gender norms people are expected to conform to, a budget that goes entirely to the military, as well as public education and health programs failing the general public on a routine basis. Still, greatest country in the world. Thank you, Sam. Now there's two intrinsic parts of Crazy Taxi's identity that portray the flaws of America, unabashedly in-your-face product placement of real-world brands, and a soundtrack comprised of songs by The Offspring and Bad Religion. The PS3, XBLA, and PC versions actually did remove the product placement and replace the music with songs from other bands, and these songs are alright, but they don't yell the identity of Crazy Taxi to me, so I'm gonna ignore them for today. There's a handy mod pack to restore the soundtrack and product placement in the Steam version, as well as add some extra Offspring and Bad Religion songs into the rotation to keep the music fresh. Let's start with product placement, because it's a bit more more obvious. People don't usually like advertisements. Capitalist antics have led to the biggest brands on earth to spread unchecked globally with no sign of stopping because of the loopholes allowed in the US government. As such, within the nondescript Californian city, passengers will request the cabbie to take them to places such as Pizza Hut, Vila Sportswear, KFC, Levi's Jeans, and Tower Records. This is one of the most in-your-face product placement in games, which gives Crazy Taxi a more realistic American feel. And what's more important to keep in mind with this fact is is that Crazy Taxi was released in 1999 and created by an almost entirely Japanese team. An important attribute to look at since the brands picked all had a Japanese presence in the 90s, and their inclusion in the game isn't an inherent critique of capitalism or praise of it, just an acknowledgement of their high standing as international retailers, which you as a player can interpret as you wish. And now the music, that's a bit different. So there's the obvious bit here that the Offspring and Bad Religion are just popular bands, with the two of them being partial driving forces for the punk rock revival in the 90s through the 2000s, but it also plays into one of the key points of punk music, which is the critique of societal norms and values. So in the arcade version, there's two songs from each during the main portion of the game, plus another Bad Religion song in the credits, and one more instrumental portion of their songs from each during menus. Again, the popular soundtrack restoration mod adds in more, but I'm only analyzing it as originally printed. Each song chosen critiques a specific American problem from a very 90s point of view. For The Offspring, there's All I Want and Way Down the Line, both from their album Ixne on the the first airing the griefs of the common person who in the greater cogs of society feel as if their voice isn't heard, especially when it breaks away from the norms already set. While well, the second song is about the cyclical nature of American livelihood that's passed down for multiple generations. While well, the two bad religion songs are Them and Us and Ten in 2010. Them and Us should be pretty obvious by the title. It's about the antagonism people will throw towards anyone that shows a difference of idea or physical feature than them, exaggerating differences between people for their own causes. While well, Ten in 2010 is named from a small theory prevalent in the 90s that the world population would reach 10 billion by 2010. Which obviously didn't happen, but the song itself discusses the issues of people not caring to solve the issue of caring for the ever-growing population, as they care the most about themselves. A still somewhat prevalent topic, just a name that didn't quite stick. These songs are somewhat over the top with how they portray the issues, and by that I mean they scream about it, which I guess is at the least accurate to portrayals of West Coast youth culture. Don't get me wrong, I fucking love these songs, I listen to them all the time, I'm just saying that they only touch on the baseline subjects in question, and this isn't a music analysis video, I don't want to go too deep about each song. But then without this music, Crazy Taxi isn't the same. It makes the story go from some crazy taxi drivers to relatable youth desiring for a change in society, one they know they can't make themselves. So instead, they follow their instincts and break for their own freedom. A freedom which in some ways is an idea fed to them by the media. The true ideals of America isn't something you can state that easily. It's the most powerful country in the world, and everyone believes they know what it is. Whether they're born and raised in the US of A or not. Or even if they're raised in this part of America or that part of it. Hell, my vision of it is probably more in line with a metropolitan from Hong Kong than someone in Diamondville, Wyoming. The point I want to drive home is that American culture and soft power is a mess that the entire world can see. Our flaws, our dreams, our hopes, and our economic system are things everyone has felt the repercussions 
repercussions of. So much so that one of the best representations of the ideals associated with the United States wasn't even made here. America's power globally is just kind of insane. Dare I say, even crazy. 